All right. So, um, hello, my name is Simon, and uh, this is uh, Jacob. And uh, welcome to our presentation about our thesis work that we have nicknamed Tiger Shrimp. Uh, Tiger Shrimp is a understandable tracing just in time compiler for the Java virtual machine. And that is a lot of words desc describing just one thing. So, we're going to start with a little bit of background. Uh, oh. Like when uh, writing code in a high level language, like the one here we can see to the left, um, we write in such a way that we and other programmers can understand what is written and also easily contribute to it. However, a processor or, the, or a computer really doesn't know how to evaluate such programs and need something more to write. To this end, we need uh, programs that can help us, uh, or help the computer evaluate such programs here that we have to the left. And there are different approaches to this, uh, but in the purpose of this presentation, we will go through interpretation and compilation. Inter interpretation is what we call uh, the process of evaluating code more or less at this, as it was written. So in the example here to the right, uh, an interpreter will evaluate this, this code line by line and sub-expression by sub-expression. And the benefit from doing it like this is that we don't need to do much work before we can start evaluating the program, and the startup time, uh, time can be really fast. It's also quite easy to understand how each of these uh, sub-expressions should be evaluated, so it can be quite easy to implement and understand an interpreter. However, um, this way of evaluating a program can be quite slow compared to other methods. Compilation, on the other hand, is what we call the process of translating code in uh, one language into another. And in the example here, uh, we have translated or compiled this code into native code, which can be actually run directly on the processor. And you can see that even though this uh, code here is more lines than the uh, non-compiled code, this, each of these instructions can be valued directly on the processor, and therefore the performance of this code is much higher. And the pro problem with compilation is that it can be a, quite a complex uh, process of doing these translations. And also the compiler can be very involved in complex systems. So it can be hard to understand and implement a compiler. And the, the most often used case of, of, of uh, compil compilers is where you take, like we've done here, a program in a higher level language into a lower le level language, uh, a, level, a language that is more uh, similar to what a processor can understand. And this is also the case that the, the benefits from compilation is that we can all um, we can we can produce very efficient code. And many applications of compilers is where we take the entire program and compile it before we run it. And that is referred to ahead of time compilation. But there are other ways. In the program we have here, we can see that um, if you have a function that would benefit from both interpretation and compilation, the, the lines before the loop are only run once, and therefore we don't benefit that much from compiling that code. Uh, because the compile time will probably be, be longer than the actual uh, total, how much time we earn from compiling that part. Um, however, the, the loop that we will run for very many iterations, we will really benefit from compiling that part. So the overall performance of this function will be uh, more efficient. This is just how just-in-time compilers work. It can, during runtime, uh, choose different parts of the program to optimize during runtime and switch between running native code and interpreting some code. And for uh, dynamic languages like JavaScript and others, um, where types and other information is not available at, before we run the program, this is the only way of compiling these programs. There are different just-in-time compilers, and they have different ways of uh, different approaches of choosing what parts of the program to optimize. And we, in this thesis, has, have uh, focused on just tracing just-in-time compilers, uh, which bases their optimizations on, optimizations on traces. And a trace is a sequence of code. Um, and if that code branches, like if in the example here, we have an if statement. Uh, um, the trace describes exactly one path through that code. And we do that uh, because of two assumptions. Uh, we have the first assumption is that uh, a loop will spend most of its time, of its time or execution time in a few hot loops. Uh, and within these loops, there are a path 
or a trace that is more commonly used than others. And this last assumption is why we only compile traces, because we, we since we're doing this at runtime, uh, we only want to spend time compiling code that is actually run the most and we benefit from compiling them while not compiling code that really not benefit from compiling. Um, and a, so a tracing just-in-time compiler has many parts that all need to be working together. Uh, it needs an interpreter for non-compiled code. It needs a, a way of finding hot loops. From these hot loops, hot loops, it needs to be able to extract traces. Uh, it needs a compiler for these traces. It needs a way of executing these traces natively. And since we have these two modes of either uh, executing code natively and either um, uh, interpreting code, we need a way of syncing these states together. And all these parts need to be working together, which makes a tracing just-in-time compiler quite complex. And also more commercial uh, tracing just-in-time compilers, like the one formerly used in Mozilla's JavaScript engine, SpiderMonkey, uh, they're all built with efficiency and performance in mind, and therefore that can also really complicate the product. And this is where our thesis product fits in. Yes. So our goal was to um, implement a tracing just-in-time compiler that is uh, designed for understandability. Um, now, understandability is quite a subjective goal. Like there's no there's no clear way of proving whether we succeeded with this or not. Um, so instead, uh, we focused uh, on some criteria that we believe contribute to the understanding of a project like this. Um, we made sure that uh, all of the different parts of the compiler are well divided into distinct modules with a, with a clear purpose for, for each of them. Um, and we also wanted uh, the connection between these modules and how the behavior of, of one of them affects uh, the others to be clear and, and easy to follow. Um, and in addition to this, we've, we've developed an, an accompanying visualization toolkit that uh, can show off some runtime behavior uh, of our tracing just in time compiler. Uh, and we will demonstrate this visualization later, but now we'll go through step-by-step step, uh, how our tracing just in time compiler works. Um, so it starts uh, by simply interpreting the code, the source code uh, line by line. Um, and this makes the startup times very fast, uh, which is good, but unfortunately, the process of interpreting a program is, is quite slow, so we need to take some steps to try and figure out which parts that we want to compile. Um, so while interpreting, we uh, will count how many times each line of code is evaluated. Um, and we do this to find the parts of the code that is executed the most. Um, and more specifically, we're looking for, for loop headers, because as we mentioned, loops is where a program spends most of the time evaluating. Um, and once a loop has been run a set amount of times, we consider that, that loop a hot loop, and we will start recording it. Um, and recording means that as we're interpreting, we're also saving that instruction into a list uh, to use later. Um, and we're recording exactly one trace through a loop. And remember, a trace is exactly one path. So in this example, here, one path would be the one taken through the uh, the first if statement um, seen here with the with the red line in the in the flow chart. Um, and uh, there are there are ways of, of finding exactly which trace in a loop is the most common one, uh, but that takes quite a bit of time. So instead, we just assume that the first trace that we find is uh, one of the most common ones, uh, and uh, so we record only that. Uh, we also need to keep track of where the code branches, because if at a later state uh, we go through the loop, but uh, we, for example, i is larger than 500, so we will start by uh, executing the trace, and then we get to the if statement, and we have to branch out of the trace. Uh, and then the interpreter will have to take back control, so we need to keep track of where it's supposed to continue evaluating after it's exited. Um, and we call these cases uh, side exits. Um, now, recording continues until the start of the loop is once again reached. Uh, and when recording is, is finished, this uh, 
the recorded trace can be compiled into native code uh, save and saved into memory uh, so that we can uh, we can execute this code uh, at a later stage whenever we want to. Um, and we need to save the position of where each trace starts so that the next time we reach that position in the code, we can just run the code natively instead of continuing interpreting. Um, and now you'll see this, uh, this diagram starting to look kind of like a loop that you can follow around. Uh, and one loop through this represents uh, one iteration, so one uh, line of code that is being evaluated. Um, and as we mentioned before, we just assume that the first trace that we take through a loop is, the, is uh, a common one. But it might be that uh, several paths are taken many times. Uh, and in that case, we also need to uh, count the number of times each side exit is taken through a trace um, so that we can uh, start recording them when they get hot. Uh, and they are recorded in uh, the same way as a regular trace, uh, with just one exception. Uh, and that is because the, the switching between interpretation and native execution is, is, a, is a costly process. We don't want to have to do it too many times. So in this case, where the red trace would exit into the blue trace, we just uh, have it jump directly from one trace to another without the interpreter taking back control in the middle, um, which just saves time in the long run. Um, and now this is uh, our entire uh, runtime loop of our uh, compiler. Uh, and just for completion's sake and for comparing it with the code, it starts up in the top left corner uh, and then just follows the arrows around the, around the diagram. Um, now, since we uh, since our, we, our implementation focused on uh, on separation of concern in these independent modules, we were able to construct this quite short runtime loop that really describes the the entire program, uh, like the entire tracing just in time compiler. Uh, and we're not going to go through the entire code because it's going to take a while and not be very interesting. But we're just going to look at the last line of the code where it says interpreter eval instruction. Um, and how that corresponds exactly to the box in the lower left corner, uh, and this goes for for the rest of the of the parts of the compiler as well. Um, and we believe that these uh, the similarities here in theory and implementation really uh, really contribute to to making this uh, an understandable tracing just in time compiler. All right, so. So I mentioned in the beginning that our uh, compiler implements the Java Builder machine. And so before we can demonstrate our uh, visualizing tool, uh, we, I just need to go through a little bit of aspects of the JVM uh, for it to make sense. Uh, so the JVM is a, a um, hardware computer simulated in software, and it runs a, a bytecode language. Uh, which is more similar to native code than uh, Java code. And we can see here in the example, uh, we, have, we have compiled this Java code into this uh, JVM bytecode. And this bytecode then can be, can be interpreted or further compiled then. And the JVM uses a stack and a variable store to keep track of all its runtime values. Uh, and so we're going to, for you to understand these two concepts, we're going to go through the bytecodes here uh, and see how these um, how these structures are used. So in a stack, uh, we can only put values on top of the stack or remove them from the top of the stack. So the iconst zero uh, instruction will put a constant zero on the stack. The i store zero will move that from the top of the stack into the variable store at address zero. Icons two will put a constant two on the stack. Icons i stores one will uh, move that to the variable store at address one i load one will copy the value from the variable store at address one to the top of the stack. And i const one will just put a constant one on the stack. And i add will take the two topmost values of the stack and place them with the sum of these two. And i store zero will move that uh, value from the top of the stack to the variable store again. So now you might have the better understanding how the Java virtual machine works. And it's time for our demonstration. So um, we're going to now go through uh, this program. We have the Java code here uh, on the uh, left and uh, compile bytecode to the right. Um, 
The interesting part with this program is that we have a loop that will run for many, very many iterations and have three distinct paths to that, to that loop. And they all will be run for many iterations uh, and therefore become hot in, at some point. Um, all right. Uh, so here is our um, um, visualizing tool. And our visualizing tool works in this way as it runs our tracing just in time compiler within this, this tool. Uh, and during runtime, it will extract uh, runtime information from the compiler. And in the top left corner here, we can see the state of our compiler. Um, so now it says interpreting because we're going to start interpreting the program. And then under, uh, under this, we have uh, the registers, which is, which, is, which, which is the actual physical registers on this computer. And is in one sense is the, the lowest representation of our uh, compiler process. To right here, we see all the bytecodes that we are going to evaluate. Uh, and the arrow indicates which uh, instruction is to be evaluated next. We also have the variable store and uh, the stack. And we're going to see how, uh, during runtime, how the, they are used by the interpreter. So now, when we, uh, we start evaluating, we, we can just see uh, how the, the interpreter moves forward through the code. And now, uh, when, we, when the interpreter moves back, uh, our profiler think that this might be a potential loop header. And therefore, we have indicated this row as red. And the one indicates uh, how many iterations we have moved uh, through that code into this loop. And uh, we will we continue interpreting. And we have a threshold for on three. So uh, when we have uh, evaluated this loop three times, um, it will be considered hot. And we will start recording. And now when we are recording, um, we can see that the recorded uh, instructions are uh, turning purple. And the uh, interesting part to see here is also that you, the trace doesn't need to be a continuous block of code. Uh, but when we have recorded it, we will treat it as a continuous block of code. And now when we are back again at the loop header, we, are com we have a completed recording and the compile and we have compile this trace. And we can also see what code be generated for this, uh, for this particular trace. And one interesting, interesting part here to see is that the actual code for the trace is from line 5 until line 27. So the, the code around that is just of handling uh, when we entering and exiting this trace. Uh, so now um, we have associated this compile trace to this loop header. So we will evaluate this uh, code uh, natively instead. And we have no way of showing how this um, code is evaluated natively. Uh, so we will only see when the interpreter takes back control. Uh, so uh, right now, we can see that this code has not been compiled, uh, and therefore the interpreter takes back control. So we are in the one of the other uh, if statements. Uh, and we can see how up here in the variable store, uh, the, the variables have really changed. Um, and since we uh, like Jacob said before, we want to be able to compile more traces through that through this loop if they become hot. Uh, therefore, we have this row is now also indicated as uh, a potential loop header uh, or what to say. Uh, and also, we indicate how many times we have exited through this uh, side exit. Uh, and this process will go on because now we had we exited through the other side exit, and we have the same uh, threshold for. Uh, hot side exits as we have for hot loops. So uh, when this side exit has been um, reached uh, three times, right now, uh, we will start recording this side exit as well. Uh, so uh, when we now we don't uh, really we don't wait until we come back to the side where the side exit started. Uh, so we have. We are done with the recording when we reach the loop header again because we compiled the, the rest of the loop that needed um, that we had you know, hadn't compiled before. So now these two parts of the loop can be run uh, without the interpreter needing to take back control. Um, and all right, so now this other side exit also became hot. Uh, so we will record that as well and compile it. And now these all three parts of the loop is. Uh, is uh, combined together. So 
we they will uh, will we will be able to execute the rest of the iterations through this loop without interpreter need, needing to make to back, take back control. All right. So now we have we are done evaluating this loop, and we can see that the values have really increased a lot here. And the interesting part to see from this loop or from this uh, code example here is that the the first inst instructions of this function were never uh, compiled because they were only ran once. Uh, and this is the same for this return statement here. Uh, it's also interesting to see that during runtime, when other when different parts of the code became hot. We compile them one after each other to overall uh, like make the performance better of this uh, program. So this was a demo or visualizing too. Right. Um, so performance uh, wasn't really a goal that we had for this uh, project. Uh, but even so, we wanted to run some tests just to find out if uh, tracing just-in-time compilation actually had any impact on execution times. Uh, because we wouldn't want it to be uh, slower than, than pure interpretation, because then there would really be no point to it. Um, so you can see in this graph, the, the blue bars represent uh, pure interpretation. Uh, so all tracing functionality is turned off. We're not uh, counting for hot loops. We're not uh, recording anything. We're not compiling any code. We're just uh, interpreting the, 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 the code uh, line by line. Um, and as you can see, uh, for some cases, it's uh, it takes uh, very, very a very long time uh, because this the y-axis here is is on a logarithmic scale, so each um, step up, as you say, would be uh, a tenfold increase. So for the first test here, you can see it's almost uh, like around a thousand times slower to uh, interpret than to use the the tracing just-in-time compiler. Um, and even more interesting, interestingly, is when we look at the execution times that uh, Open uh, uh, JDK, the uh, Java engine, uses um, for for the same code. That we can see that we actually even outperform that in a few specialized cases, um, and that is interesting because the only real optimization that we did was this tracing just in time compilation. We didn't actually optimize the native code in any way, and if if so, if we were, we would probably uh, achieve even greater results. Um, right. So we have now shown you uh, the results of our work here in these last four months, uh, which is a tracing just-in-time compiler that is designed for understandability. Um, and the basis of this design is uh, its high separation of uh, responsibility among the different modules making up the tracing JIT compiler. Um, we have described the theory behind it how, and uh, the theory behind it and uh, shown how uh, the implementation corresponds well with this with this description. Um, and due to this, uh, the separation of the different modules, uh, improving, for example, the, the bytecode to native code compiler uh, wouldn't be that big of, a, of an assignment because um, since it's uh, the way since it's it's confined entirely within one module, it doesn't actually affect the rest of the program that much. So as long as the input has the same form and, and as long as it produces output in the same form, then we could uh, improve just that part and not have to worry about how it affects the rest of the program. And that goes as well for the example, for example, the interpreter or the recorder or any other parts of the program. Um, and on top of this, our uh, visualization tool can give further insight into the inner workings of our of our compiler. Um, it shows the different stages it goes through while evaluating a program. Uh, it shows where the most executed parts are uh, and uh, what the recorded uh, bytecodes are and how the compiled code looks. Uh, and we believe that this all of this contributes to uh, the understanding of, of uh, a tracing just in time compiler and we also believe that this is the first uh, the first of its kind um, so thank you all very much for listening um, now before opening up to questions we would just like to uh, thank our supervisor Manus Miren for his uh, valuable insight and guidance throughout this project uh, we uh, would not have gone this far without his help so thanks a lot Magnus um, so yeah now we'll have some time for questions and uh, yeah, we'll start with the opponent group, Johannes of Hill.